Okay. Just, just wait. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, it's always a strange experience. Everybody's silent. You start talking, you think you're talking to yourself. Which of course, maybe the case if everybody's nodded off, of course. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, you look as if you're awake still. So, oh, hang on a minute. Oh, that's it. So we're on the redemption of the rem uh, about the redemption of the remnant, part four. Uh, I'm going to do and uh, ask the question: What is the overall message of Ezra and Nehemiah? So, just to recap, in the first session, we saw that God's purpose in judging Israel was not just to punish them for wrongdoing, although he did that, but to bring them to repentance. In the second session, we looked at Cyrus and the fall of Babylon. Babylon must fall. Babylon fell in 539 BC. I hope you've got that date in your head now. And when was when Persian King Cyrus conquered Babylon without a fight. In the third session, we concentrated on God's long-term plan. So we saw that this was not the return of the remnant to Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the city and the temple and so on. It was the coming of the Messiah. And it was God coming into his new covenant temple and so on. So as I say, in this session, we'll, we'll take an overview of the books of Ezra and Nehemiah and try to answer the question, what is the overall message of Ezra and Nehemiah? So just a few preliminary comments. Uh, Ezra and Nehemiah are actually one book. Apparently, they were originally written as two separate books, but early on, they were combined in the Hebrew scriptures. And later on, they were separated again by Oregon, something like that. I think he called them Ezra 1 and Ezra 2 originally. And it's widely believed that Ezra and Nehemiah were written by the same person. So here's a quote from somebody. Most scholars conclude that the author compiler of Ezra and Nehemiah was also the author of one and two chronicles. So one and two chronicles also actually were originally one book, but the it was the Septuagint translators who split them into uh, two books. So here's a quick overview. So Ezra 1, 1 to 4, 5 is, is history from 539 to 522 BC. Now, you have to keep your eye on this green thing. I'm going to mention this green bit three times, and I'm going to uh, talk about it in a little bit more detail the third time. But from Ezra chapter 4, verse 6 up to verse 23, these are later events. That is after 485 BC in the time of King Xerxes and King Ar Artaxerxes. So you see, you've skipped a whole lot of years from, so for some reason, the author Ezra, if it is Ezra, has put this there. And then it goes back in, in chapter four, verse 24, it goes back to here. And it carries on with the history of 522 to 516 BC. And it's at this time that Haggai and Zechariah were, were prophesying. And then Ezra 7, 1 onwards for the rest of the book, these are later events. So that's after 465. So this was after 485. This is after 465 BC. And then the whole of Nehemiah is also later events after 465. And it's at this time that Malachi was prophesying, although he's not mentioned in the books. Malachi was prophesying in the background. So I'm now going to do, this is what I call the blue table. I'm now going to do the gray table. Here's the gray table. It's exactly the same as the blue table, but with a few more details. It starts the same, you see. And so it's, I've already mentioned this bit, but the, the Persian kings at this time were Cyrus the Great. He's the one we've talked about. He conquered Babylon. And then his son and his son, and then Darius the first. So the, these two come into the story. Darius I became the Persian king in 522 BC. So that's quite a key date. And then this is the green book, 
the green bit we have to keep our eyes on. These are the later events. And the, I've already mentioned this is Xerxes the first. These were his dates. And this was actually Esther's husband, who in the Bible, he's called Ahaz Eris, but everybody agrees it's, it's Xerxes and so on. And then Artax Xerxes, these were his, his ruling dates. And this was Nehemiah's uh, boss. So remember this green bit has just been inserted. Uh, it's a la later event. For some reason, the, the author Ezra, I guess, inserted it into the events there. Not really going to talk about why today. And then it carries on, remember from verse 24, um, the history of 522 to 516, and the, the Persian kings were Darius the first. So I've, I've just mentioned him. So Haggai and Zechariah were prophesying, and then the temple was completed in 516 BC. And remember, that's 70 years after 586 BC, which was when the temple was destroyed by the Babylonians. And then Ezra 7 1 onwards, and the whole of Nehemiah, these are events in, in the reign of Artaxerxes. Uh, after 465, when he, he came to, to reign, Nehemiah's boss, and as I said already, Malachi was prophesying at this time. So that bit, blank bit is supposed to show me, I'm supposed to look at my notes now. So the tradition is that Ezra wrote all these books, Chronicles, uh, Ezra and Nehemiah, and that may well be the case. But the main point is, that these books were, were written very late in the uh, Old Testament Jewish era. So even Chronicles was written uh, late uh, if, Ezra, if Ezra was the, the author, and even if Ezra wasn't the author, they were written late. So the author was looking back over events, not writing them at the time. I'm thinking particularly of one and two Chronicles, at least not writing so many of them at the time. And I've got a, a study Bible and it said that this comment was, one of its comments was that the books of the kings, one and two kings were written for exiled Israel and Judah. And uh, the books of Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah were written for the returned remnant. But of course, the, the early returned remnant, the ones who came back with Zerubbabel and, and so on, they wouldn't have had the books of Chronicles or Ezra or Nehemiah. So they would have only had the one and two kings and so on. Because you know, these, these books follow much of the same history, although there's slightly different emphases and so on. So Ezra himself didn't return from Babylon to Jerusalem 539 BC uh, with the exiles. The reason was, of course, he wasn't alive at the time. He came into the story much later. Haggai and Zechariah were amongst those who came back to, to Jerusalem at that time. And so there, there's a big link between uh, Haggai and Zechariah, the books Haggai and Zechariah, and some parts of Ezra. That is the first half of Ezra. In some ways, you can think of Ezra as being two books in one. There's the, the, the first half, the, the, the early history of the returned exiles, and then but with that little bit, that green bit inserted, and then you've got the the, um, the the second part, which is Ezra and Nehemiah's time. And parts of both the, both the books are memoirs. So Ezra has his memoirs, Nehemiah have has his memoirs, and uh, they say the Ezra Ezra memoirs are dated around 440 BC. And the Nehemiah me uh, memoirs around 430 BC. And but there are also, if you notice, there are also a few bits written in the first person in the first half of uh, Ezra. So of course, neither Ezra nor on, on Nehemiah were there, so they couldn't have written those bits. So presumably, they they got that material from some other available sources. So the traditional view is that Ezra arrived in Jerusalem in 58, uh, 458 BC, sorry, not 5, 458 BC, 458 BC. That's the seventh year of Artaxerxes. And Nehemiah, because he started reigning in 465 BC, 
Nehemiah, and the traditional view is that Nehemiah arrived in Jerusalem in 444 BC. That's the 20th year of Artaxerxes. And uh, as I said, uh, the first chapters of Ezra, therefore history to him, events which happened decades before he went to Jerusalem, except for the green book bit, which we'll come back to in a minute. So most of the, the books are written in Hebrew, but there are a few Aramaic bits. Aramaic was the sort of common language, a bit like English today, I suppose. And so when any communication is being made with uh, the Persian kings and so on, Aramaic is used in the, in the books. Right, so now I've got to go to the, yes. Now I've got to swap actually because my PowerPoint, I put my table on the PowerPoint and it uh, doesn't work very well. So I think I've got it here. Yes, yeah, so we're going to look at this one. So this is, I'm very, very quickly going to go through all the chapters, Ezra overview of the chapters. So, uh, and, and note the dates. Uh, chapter one, the Cy Cyrus decrees, decrees that the Jews should go back to Jerusalem to build the temple. That's either 539 BC or 538. I'm not going to quibble about the dates. So in chapter two, the remnant returned to Jude, Jerusalem. That's Zerubbabel, Joshua, and so on, about 536 BC. In chapter three, the altar is built. Uh, worship is restored in Jerusalem. The Feast of Tabernacles is kept. Work on the temple is started. The foundation is laid. That's all 536 BC. And then you get to this thing in chapter four. So we look at this very quickly. So let me read it and then I'll point it out to you. If you've got your Bible, you, you, you'll you find it worth flicking through these things as we go along, actually. So this is chapter four. Uh, in the first five verses, the Jews are resisted in their temple building. That's 534 BC. And then from this is the green bit I keep mentioning from verse six up to 23. There's letters of complaint from complaint from some of the locals. One to Xerxes, that's Ahaz Uerus in verse six and two to Artaxerxes. So that's got to be after 485 BC. And then it skips back, but verse 24, the work on the rebuilding temple stops. So if you look at chapter four, it says, verse four, verse one. Now, when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the descendants of the captivity were building the temple of the Lord God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses. So remember Zerubbabel, came from Babylon in about 536 BC. So it's definitely talking uh, about that. And it says in verse five, and they, um, without going into all the details, they hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So remember he came to reign in 522 BC. Then in verse six, it skips. In the reign of Ahasuerus, some translations will put Xerxes. In the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, so he didn't begin reigning until 485, so he skipped. They wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. Then in verse 7, it says, in the days of Artaxerxes, so that's a further 20 years on. Also, Bishlam, Mithridath, Tabal, and the rest of their companions wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia, and the letter was written in Aramaic script and so on. We're not going to go into all the details uh, tonight. And then at verse 23, it says, now when the copy of, of uh, King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Reham, Shimshai, and <clears throat> so on, um, the scribe and their companions, they went up in haste to Jerusalem against the Jews and by force of arms made them cease. Now, they're talking about building the walls and all sorts of things here, rather than the temple. But then in verse 24, it skips back. So really, verse 24 carries straight on from verse 5. Verse 5 says, they hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia, verse 24, thus the work of the house of God, which is at Jerusalem, ceased. And it was discontinued until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So I, and, until I realized that, I found that very uh, complicated because um, there are some similar events there. For some reason, 
Ezra decided to put that in. I'm not going to discuss the reason tonight, that bit in, which comes later on. So I'm carrying on now with my overview. Chapter five, the work, the work on the temple is resumed following the exhortations of Haggai and Zechariah. Look, it says, but chapter five, verse one, then the prophet Haggai and Zechariah, the son of Ido prophets, prophesied to the Jews who were in Judah and Jerusalem and so on and so forth. So they started to get on. So that's now 520 BC. Um, the work had stopped, had stopped for some time, something like 15 or 16 years, something like that. But that we're not going to talk about that tonight. And then Tatanai, the Persian governor, writes to the Persian king Darius to ask if the Jews have authority to build the temple. So there's, 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 there's it's a similar story to uh, chapter four, but it's a different time. It's, my, it's before any of the events of the letter in chapter four. And then he, they, they, um, Darius looks up in the archives and he reads Cyrus's decree. This is in about 519 BC. Darius says they can go ahead with the temple rebuilding. This is all in chapter six. And so the temple is completed and dedicated in 516 BC, as we said. And then the Passover is kept. And then it skips again. So we got up to 516 BC. And then Ezra arrives in 458 BC. Uh, he comes from Persia. He arrives in Jerusalem, bringing him uh, with him a letter, a decree from King Artaxerxes. And I talked a little bit about that chapter, mentioned that chapter last time, but I won't recap on that. Right. Chapter eight is a more detailed description of Ezra's trip back to Jerusalem. So it's the same year. Chapter nine, there's problems. The Jews have intermarried with pagans, 457. Chapter 10, the people confess their improper marriages and put away their pagan wives. And that's the end of Ezra. And now we do Nehemiah. We do a blitz through Nehemiah. But the comment I've made here is that in contrast to Ezra, Nehemiah records events that occur mostly over one year. Whereas you can see the events over um, in, in Ezra are, are, are blocked together but they're definitely not over one year and they're two distinct time periods. So you know all this, these things, so that's why I'm skipping through it. Chapter one, ne Nehemiah hears about the troubles in Jerusalem. That's about 445 BC. And then the rest of these will be, except the last one will be 444 BC. Uh, chapter two, Nehemiah speaks to King Artaxerxes about going to Jerusalem. This is famous, isn't it? He returns to Jerusalem, he surveys the city walls, the city wall rebuilding begins, the Jews have to defend the city walls against enemies, all 444 BC. Nehemiah has to sort out oppression between Jewish brethren in Judah, a uh, conspiracy against Nehemiah by Sambala and Tobiah, the city wall is completed, the people who came back to Jeru Judah, Jerusalem are listed, so he actually lists the, the various returns, so he lists the rubble and all the others as well, the different returns. There are actually three returns. we we'll come to that in a minute. So chapter eight, Ezra and the priests spend a day publicly teaching the Jews the law. Uh, this is one of my favorite uh, chapters, chapter eight. I'm talking about in the Bible. It's one of my favorite <laughs> chapters, uh, but I'm not going to talk about why. Uh, the Feast of Tabernacles is kept. Chapter nine, the people confess their sins. The people make a covenant. Chapter 10, the covenant is sealed. Chapter 11, decisions are made about who should live in Jerusalem and who outside Jerusalem. Chapter 12, the priests and Levites are listed. There's lots of lists in these books, lists of names and so on. Um, as I was discuss discussing with uh, Chris before the meeting, it's because it's real history. It's real people with real history. That's what it's about. So it can be authenticated. Uh, the city wall is dedicated by Nehemiah. And then at some point, Nehemiah goes back to his boss, King Artaxerxes. And then at some point, uh, I haven't quite worked out when um, exactly, but about 430 BC, Nehemiah returns to Jerusalem, makes some reforms to do with the temple use and tithes and the Sabbath and pagan wives. And that is the overview now I'm going to make some comments about it. So I'll just go back to my other 
thing. If I can get it. Yes. Right, so now let me get to my notes. Yeah, the main characters. Uh, it's obvious Ezra in Ezra Nehemiah is Zerubbabel. Joshua, sometimes called Jeshua, the high priest. So Zerubbabel is a leader. Haggai the prophet, Zechariah the prophet, Ezra, uh, Nehemiah, again leaders. And then Malachi, although he doesn't appear anywhere in the books, he's prophesying in uh, the background. So it seems to me you've got two strands here. You've got the story, the history, as told in Ezra and Nehemiah. And at the same time, you've got what God was saying at the time, as recorded in the prophets Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. So in an overview sense, what is Ezra Nehemiah about? I'm calling it Ezra Nehemiah because it's really one book. So it's about three groups of redeemed remnants returning to Jerusalem on three occasions. So one group came with Zerubbabel, one group came with Ezra, one group came with Nehemiah. They're all listed there. It's about Jerusalem and its temple. And it's about three the three leaders, Zerubbabel, Ezra, and Nehemiah. And it's all about the prophets uh, prof prophesying. So the leaders, they each return to Jerusalem at different times with a remnant, as I've said. They each have a vision and they bring hope to the Jews. They each face opposition, which they need to overcome. Um, and they each have disappointments, what you might call crushing disappointments. And <clears throat> the prophets who were prophesying, these were the, the last Old Testament prophets to prophesy that we have the record of. And uh, then after that, there was and uh, well, that is the last, unless you count John the Baptist as an Old Testament prophet. But the point is, there was a big gap in in the big what I've called the big silence for about four hundred years after Malachi finished his prophesying. So I said, these leaders, they they all had a vision and they had disappointments. What were the visions? and the disappointment. So if we think about Zerubbabel first, his vision was to rebuild the temple, to have God back in, in the midst of Israel. But the disappointment, it seems to me, is that there was no glory in the temple, no presence of God. If we, I think I put this one up, let me just check, yes. We read this. This, this. this is the completion of the temple in Ezra 6, starting at verse 15. Now, the temple was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, which was in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. So that's 516 BC, because the, the reign of Darius started in 522 BC. Then the children of Israel, the priests and the Levites, and the rest of the descendants of the captivity celebrated the dedication of this house of God with joy. And they offered sacrifices at the dedication of this house of God, 100 bulls, 200 rams, 400 lambs, and as a sin offering for all Israel, 12 male goats, according to the number of the tribes of Israel. They assigned the priests to their divisions and the Levites to their divisions over the service of God in Jerusalem, as it is written in the book of Moses. But if you, so that's what happened. That, 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 that's a record of it. But if you compare it with, what happened in history. This is Exodus chapter 40, starting at the end of verse 33. So this is when the, the tabernacle was set up, when the tabernacle was finished. So what we've just read in Ezra was when Zerubbabel's temple, what's called the second temple, was finished. So it says here, so Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting. Immediately you have a difference. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. There's no mention of glory in the other account. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, 
the children of Israel would go onward in all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then they did not journey till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day, and fire was over it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. So you have, you have what you might call the tangible, the manifest presence of God. And it's not just there, but if, we, if, if, if I show you the, here's the day that the, this is Leviticus chapter 9, verse 22. This is the day that the priests were consecrated. Aaron and his sons. And it says, we're not going to read all that, but it says at the end of the, that, this passage about their consecration, verse 22. Then Aaron lifted his hand toward the people, blessed them, and came down from offering the sin offering and the burnt offering and peace offerings. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of meeting and came out and blessed the people. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And fire came down out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. When all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces as they well might. So you've got fire coming from before the Lord and you've got glory. You've got the same thing. And then if, we, if you think about uh, Solomon's temple. So this is now 2 Chronicles Five verse 11, and it came to pass when the priests came out of the most holy place. So this is when the temple was dedicated. It's, it's finished. Solomon's temple is ready. They put the ark into the, into, the, into the most holy place, and that's why they're coming out. For all the priests who were present had sanctified themselves without keeping to their divisions. And the, the Levites who were the singers, all those of Asaph and Heman and Jetuthan with their sons and their brethren stood at the east end of the altar clothed in white linen, having cymbals, stringed instruments and harps, and with them 120 priests sounding with trumpets. It was a tremendous time. They were making a lot of uh, joyful noise. Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and singers were as one, to make one sound, to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and cymbals, and instruments of music and praise the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy for endures forever, that the house, the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud, so that the priests could not continue ministering because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. When Solomon dedicated his temple, God came. Uh, the cloud came, the glory came. They, they rejoiced, as we read in Ezra, they, they, they rejoiced there, but, but there was no cloud, there was no glory. And then it carries on because Solomon prays a very long prayer. And then this is 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 1. When Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. When all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on, on the pavement and worshipped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Then the king and all the people offered sacrifices before the Lord. Amen. God came. That's the, the point I'm, I'm making. But when we compare it with what we read in Ezra, then I think I'll put it up here again. Yes, there it is. They'd finished the temple. They celebrated. They dedicated the house of God with joy. They offered sacrifices, but there was no cloud, no fire from heaven, no glory, no manifest presence of God. And to me, that must have been a huge uh, disappointment, especially considering, remember this was, this happened in 516 BC, but it's especially considering that Haggai, Haggai and Zechariah had been prophesying about this 
uh, four years before in 520 BC. All of Haggai's prophesying that we've got in the Bible is from 520 BC. And in fact, the, the dates are very specific, but we won't go into that today. So Haggai 2 verse 9, the, the glory of this latter temple. He's, he's, telling the, he's telling the people, he's encouraging them, and he's saying the glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. And then uh, Zechariah 1, 16. Therefore, thus, thus says the Lord, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it, says the Lord of hosts. And a surveyor's line shall be stretched out of Jerusalem. So he says, I am returning to Jerusalem with mercy. And so if you'd have heard those words four years before, I, and you were, especially if you were Zerubbabel and so on and others there, what would you think? You'd hear God saying he's coming to return to Jerusalem, talk about the house and so on. And I've only quoted a couple of things. I've got one more, I think. Yes, Zechariah 8, verse 3. That, Thus says the Lord, I will return to Zion and will dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be called the city of truth, the mountain of the Lord of hosts, the holy mountain. But when it came to it, they finished the temple, they dedicated the temple, and there was no glory in the temple. Nothing like what happened with the tabernacle or Solomon's temple. And so we ask the question, why? Why no glory? Why no presence of God? So that was Zerubbabel's vision, if you like. I'm calling it like that. It was God's vision. But his disappointment was no glory in the, in the, in the temple. And then you come to Ezra. So Ezra was a priest. He was a scribe. He was a teacher. He, was immer he immersed himself in the word of God, and he wanted to teach the people. So his vision, if you like, was to teach the people the law, to teach the ways of God so that the people might walk in them. But his disappointment was that the people didn't sanctify themselves. They married pagan wives and so on. They didn't separate themselves unto God. They weren't holiness unto the Lord. And as a result of the marriages and so on, Ezra tells the Israelites to divorce their wives. And in fact, that's how the book of Ezra that we have finishes in, in chapter 10. And of course, that's quite a controversial thing, which perhaps we come back to another time. And again, the, all this despite in, in, in the fact that in 518 BC, Zechariah had continued prophesying. As I said, Haggai finished his prophesying in 520 BC, but Zechariah continued. He was a younger man, and he'd been speaking to this returned remnant, and he'd been saying things like this. Thus says the Lord of hosts, behold, I will save my people from the land of the east. And from the land of the west, I will bring them back and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. They shall be my people and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. So the thing is that the Lord had brought his people back. They did dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. And yet they weren't altogether walking with God in truth and righteousness. But look at what it says here. I will save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west. So what, what is he talking about? They, they'd come back from Babylon, which is sort of eastish. It's, it's northeastish. Um, but had they come back from the west? Jesus himself used this phrase in Matthew 8. You remember Matthew 8, that is from the east and from the west. Matthew 8 is about the healing of the centurion's servant. And the centurion was a Gentile. And Jesus commends the, the centurion's faith. And so it says in verse 10, 8 verse 10, When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to those who followed, Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west. 
and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast into, out into outer, outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, and so on. He could have been quoting Zechariah. Perhaps he was quoting Zechariah. But Jesus is talking about the gathering in of the, of the Gentiles. He's talking about the gospel going to the whole world. And I think when we, we, we read those prophesying by Zechariah and Haggai, they're talking about something more than the, the, the um, remnant that had returned and the, the temple in Jerusalem and so on. Again, they are looking forward to the new covenant, to the Messiah, and, and so on. And then also, you remember, we read here, let me see if I can find it. Yes. Phrases like this, they shall be my people, I will be their, their God. And, and what does that uh, remind us of? We all, we all know what it reminds us of because Chris has read this to us many times. Uh, Jeremiah 31, 31, it is the new covenant. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. I, I, I've, 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 I've put in blue the I wills and the they, they shalls. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them. And the point is, <laughs> they'd come back from Babylon and they were still breaking the covenant, says the Lord. We're in verse 33 now. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their mind and write it in, on their hearts, and I will be their God. They shall be my people. That's the phrase we had in Zechariah. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember, I will remember no more. There are actually seven I wills if you count. There are six which I put down, but there are seven if you, I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts. Anyway, it doesn't really matter that point. It seems to me that Zechariah was using the same language um, as Jeremiah. He's using, he, he, he's predicting the new uh, covenant. If you go um, in, in, in Zechariah chapter 8, Zechariah chapter 8 is a tremendous chapter. And if you read just from verse 7 to 15, then you, you find at least six I wills, exactly like this actually, six I wills from God, and at least eight you, you shalls or they shalls in Zechariah's chapter 8. It seems to me he 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 was he was whether he knew it or not he was looking forward to this new covenant that's what he was prophesying about okay and the thing is that this returned remnant were proving as their far, forefathers did they're proving by their behavior that there's a desperate need for the new covenant so then you come to Nehemiah. Nehemiah's vision, if you like, was to rebuild Jerusalem's walls, to make Jerusalem a great city again, the city of God. But uh, here's one disappointment. When he gets back from uh, briefly visiting his, uh, his boss Artaxerxes, the king in Persia, he contends with Jerusalem's rulers in the last chapter, chapter 13. He says in verse 11, why is the house of God forsaken? He's found that the temple is being misused. Even Tobiah uh, has been given a room to stay in the temple courts. And you know, in the book of Nehemiah, Tobiah is a real baddie, but he's got a room in the temple courts. And the Levites haven't been paid, so they've gone back to their farmland uh, to sustain themselves. Also, the, the people don't keep the Lord's Sabbath. They break the Sabbath. And um, it's hardly a, the glorious city of God. It's more like, again, sadly, the city of sin. So 
the overall impression. What is the overall impression? Well, I'm suggesting the overall impression uh, might be called Ezra Nehemiah, of Ezra Nehemiah might be called failure. The people aren't really any different from their forefathers whom the Lord had judged severely and eventually exiled. And um, what, what, what is the Lord teaching his people? Is there no hope? Um, I think he's teaching his people, including us, that there is no hope of radical change under the old covenant system. God had used the nation of Israel to prove it. It's as if he'd left no stone unturned. Everything was tried. He, he had been patient. He had shown forbearance over many centuries. He had poured out wrath at times and brought judgment. And eventually there was almost a total physical destruction of Jerusalem and the land, then the exile of the people, and then the people being gathered again, uh, miraculously, if you like, to to, to Israel, and they had a, a, a new hope, the hope of new things in a new Jerusalem and with a new temple, but none of it worked. No glory in the temple, and they were still the same old people with the same old sin. So something new and different was needed, and this, this is what had been prophesied. I, I believe it, it's God, it was God's long-term plan, as we saw last time. It's what Jeremiah prophesied, as we saw. It's what Ezekiel prophesied. Ezekiel 36, a new heart I will give you, and so on. And it's what Zechariah and Haggai, I, I also believe, were prophesying. And, of course, Malachi. And so, to conclude... Um, as Ron Bailey said last week, so what? <laughs> so what? And as Les says, what is the application for us? Um, well, firstly, the, the remnant returned to Jerusalem. It was God's mighty doing. He planned it, as we saw. He prophesied it. He moved world powers around to achieve it. And he has, as it were, redeemed them with a mighty hand. He'd even moved uh, the pagan king Cyrus to facilitate the rebuilding of the temple. Uh, but after all, all that, the temple was finished and there was no glory in the temple, no presence of God. So thinking about us, the Lord has called us, his people. I don't just mean us in this meeting. I mean his his people. He's redeemed us, justified us. He's done even greater things and mightier things for us. He's made us his temple. But is there glory in our churches? Uh, is there any presence of, of, of God? Is there glory in our church? I'm not, I'm not suggesting there isn't. I'm asking the question. Or are our churches empty shells like Zerubbabel's temple. Is there glory in this temple? Me. <clears throat> we know there was glory in the early church. We know we have known glory. Do we still know it today? We need to continuously seek him, seek the Lord, worship him, bless him, live for him, listen to him, obey him, love him, and so on. And he has promised to appear in his temple. We see him appearing there at Pentecost, and <clears throat> he does reveal his glory, even if it is only through a glass darkly, um, as it says in Scripture. You know, Jesus said it in, in John 17 in the prayer. This is John 17, 22. I don't think I, I put it up there. And the, Jesus prayed, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them that they may be one just as we are one. And then skipping to verse 24, Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, for you love me before the foundation of the world. We are, we are people who are called to glory. We're called to behold his glory 
he said he's given us his glory we're to be people of glory and it, there's a foretaste of of glory to come there, of course there's there's much greater glory in in eternity we understand that but we do have this foretaste and peter said it this is 1 peter 1 verse 8 he's talking about jesus and he says whom having not seen you love though now you do not see him yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory so for us we're to be people of glory we're to be filled with his glory amen so that's the first point the second point is that the the returned remnant were taught the good word of god they were taught the lord's commandments his ordinances his statutes and all these things are good and right but they fail to live in them they didn't find the resources the, the the power within themselves to do the word of god despite patiently listening to it and uh, that's what nehemiah 8 is all about and even at one point in nehemiah just after that making a covenant with god to say they would keep god's word and yet they failed so for us we too have heard the good word of god praise god how is it working out in practice in our lives this is the, this is how we should uh, always be challenging ourselves who are we in practice are we are we daily allowing the lord to empower us change us sanctify us are we allowing this new covenant to to be working out in our lives so that is the end i have finished that is an overview of ezra and nehemiah perhaps i'll pray thank you thank you yeah lord <clears throat> We thank you for the Bible and how there's so much for us to learn from it. And we praise you for this message we see in Ezra, Nehemiah, and through these prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and so on. And we praise you, Lord, that though perhaps there was failure amongst them, yet you had your eye on your glorious church, those who would come from the east, and from the West, whether Jews or Gentiles, those who would come to your Jerusalem where you would dwell in the midst, where you do dwell in the midst. And we praise you, Lord, that we are part of that company, that remnant company, We've been called by grace into the new covenant, being called by grace to be your temple. So we worship you and praise you, Lord, and we want to respond and and seek you lord listen to you obey you put right whatever needs to be put right lord thank you that you give us this wonderful opportunity amen 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 i don't know what graham was to do